I'm a, one of my jobs, I'm a project scientist on the Sun Digital Sky Survey. And I actually, I, I write a software that analyzes spectra, classifies objects, and measures distances. So in the course of that, I've looked at a lot of spectra of galaxies and quasars. In fact, it's very likely I've looked at more spectra than maybe anyone on the planet. If not, not the most, maybe it's certainly the top five. So <laughs> spectra are really important. So, you know, astronomy, a lot of people and other scientists, sciences are often jealous of astronomers because they're really sexy science. And it's really <laughs> it's really the images that make it so sexy, right? I mean we have these beautiful images and that's what you see, that's what you see on the news, that's what you see in the planetarium. But it's it's spectra really, that's what enables us to figure out the universe. I mean we have, we have to know an amazing amount about the universe. We're gonna talk about these things quasars, which are just a single point of light. I and mean, that's what we're studying. Well, we can see the single point of light. And we're going to do this crazy model for how they work, multiple components, and all this stuff. I'll show you at the end. We, we only know that because of the spectrum. So what can we learn from spectrum? Um, the great thing about studying spectra is that it's really just sort of this core basic stuff, right? So it's chemistry, right? It's, it's, uh, it's atomic transition. It's physics. You see stuff moving around in, in dynamics and in gravity, and uh, you know it's a fun. Right. So um, my this this will be my my overview of you know what how a spectrum is produced. Something gives out light. Stuff happens to that light. And then the light comes here and we detect them. And from that, we can learn about stars, galaxies, certain special galaxies that have uh, an active nucleus, which we call ATN. And when those ATN are really powerful, they dwarf the entire galaxy, and we call them quasars. So why do things give off light? There are actually lots of reasons why light is emitted from objects. Um, perhaps the first reason is that hot stuff gives off light. So I'm giving off light now. It's in, it's in the infrared. So if you look at camera, you can see me glow. If you, uh, if you are heating up metal very hot, you see it glow red. As it's hotter, it glows warm. This is the light is giving off is black body radiation. So it's light that hot things give off. And this is really one of the sort of key components. And so that's probably the first thing we need to understand when we see the stars. We see red stars, we see blue stars, and we know, we know that the blue stars are hotter than the red stars. So right away, just by looking at the color of a star, we can figure out its temperature. Um, stars are pure black bodies, but there's a certain law this black body radiation law that shows how much light as, as a function of wavelength is emitted. Right? So that's, that's what a spectrum is. And every temperature has a certain black body spectrum. And a couple of interesting things about it. Uh, the peak wavelength varies inversely to the temperature. So if you're twice as hot, the wavelength will be cut. The amount of light coming from, from an object depends very strongly on its temperature. It's, it's the fourth power of temperature. So if something is twice as hot, it gives 16 times as much. And if you also look at the spectrum, another interesting thing is we think of cool things as being redder and hot things as being bluer, but hot things give off more light at every wavelength. So the hot things has more red light than the cool thing, it just looks blue because it's giving so much more blue light. So this is the most important thing to understand about light. But there's this other uh, really sort of magical thing. So uh, it all have, it's quantum mechanics, right? So we think of quantum mechanics as being hard, and it is hard to understand quantum mechanics. But if we didn't have quantum mechanics, 
Astronomy would be much harder. Understanding the universe would be much harder. We wouldn't be able to figure out anything. It's this sort of remarkable property of, of quantum mechanics that allows us to figure out what's going on in the universe. And that's that atoms, the electrons in those atoms, have very specific energy levels. And they travel from one energy level to another. Uh, if they go from a, uh, a higher energy level to a lower energy level, they give off light. And they give off light at a very specific frequency. And that, that's the, a very remarkable thing. It allows us to identify what something is made of. I mean, it was one of the, the big questions of sort of early science. It was an example, one thing we always wondered about is, you know, there's no reason why we should be able to figure out how the universe works, right? I mean, there's no reason the laws of physics should be discernible. And one example that was given centuries ago was star, the sun. We'll never be able to know what's inside the sun. We'll never go there, we can analyze it, but we know what's inside the sun because of this property. So there are always these little hints that let us figure out something. So because of this, because of quantum mechanics, different elements give off very specific frequencies of light when they're heated. Um, this one at the top is hydrogen. Hydrogen just has a few lines. The one at the bottom is iron. Iron has tons of lines. It's got a lot more atoms. There are a lot more potential energy levels. Many, many more protons and electrons. So, uh, so that's the basic thing. It's basic chemistry. Remember, there are sort of there are these quantum numbers with different orbitals and, and, and these, these different uh, transition numbers and there's certain rules about what is an allowed transition and what's not. So that's all basic chemistry. Mark, how did those uh, images on the upper right-hand side, how did, where did those come from? Oh, so this is, these are, uh, uh, it's a visualization of uh, orbital level. Right, so uh, if you have a hydrogen atom in the, in, in the ground state, we expect the electron probability density. An electron isn't going around in circles, it's this quantum cloud, and that quantum cloud looks like that. Okay. That probability of where you expect to see it. As you get to more complicated orbitals, these things get very strange. Lobes with rings and really complex structures. There's a really good website on a, a British university called the Orbitron. Yeah, I was looking at that oh, last night. Fantastic. It's really cool. Way beyond what I understand, but I've got some good images. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't understand it either, but it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I, that's a good resource. And you know, you don't need to understand it either. It's just cool to look at. So that's <laughs> so, so don't worry about that. Um, now, we can do this on the ground. In fact, we were going to do that, but we. Uh, you know, when you can heat up these gas tubes, we can look at them with the diffraction gradient and see the different lines. Now, we can do it in space. And you see cool things like this is a planetary nebula. This is something like the future of our sun when it, it, glow, it, it, uh, it blows off its outer la layers and the center it collapses into a white door. And those outer layers get heated up and they're letting out this line radiation. Because it's specific frequencies of light, it's very colorful, it's very beautiful, it's like these puffy clouds. They're really beautiful things. When we look at those lines, they're not lines we see in the laboratory. So the first thing we thought is that we discovered a new type of element, a new type of matter, nebulium or something. Maybe I spelled that right, <laughs> right? And and uh, and that doesn't exist on Earth. I mean, that's kind of the situation we're in now, where we don't really understand everything that's going on in the universe. So we've, in, we've invented things like dark matter, dark energy. They explain the universe that, that don't exist here that we haven't detected. Now it turns out that this element doesn't really exist. And it goes back to those, uh, what, what I, was, I was talking about before, where these transition rules, where these orbital elements can be changed by a certain amount. Like this angular momentum quantum number can change by one, this, this, this spin number can change by a certain number. But in quantum mechanics, there really aren't any rules, right? Rules are meant to be broken. So I can try to pass this little magic trick. I'll try to pass my hand through this table, right? It didn't work that time. But according to quantum mechanics, there's a chance that will work. And if I keep trying, 
<laughs> you know, one of these days it's going to pass through. Now, unfortunately, there's a probability for everything to happen, and that probability is really low. And I can do that to the entire age of the universe, and I'll still be banging my hand against the wall. But there's a chance. It's the same way. Um, it's the same way with atoms. So there were certain transitions, there were certain rules for those transitions, but we can break those rules. In fact, we can, and, and, and there's a probability that those rules will be broken. It's a much lower probability. So when an atom's excited, there are two ways it can get. That we have a, we, we have, we have an atom, we have a nucleus, we have one, a single electron, it's an excited state, right? So it has multiple states, but it's not in its lowest state, it's in a higher state. It can pass to a lower state. But there are two ways that can happen. One is that it does so spontaneously. It just drops the lower state and lets out a photon. That's how it gives off its energy. That has a certain probability. It's relatively high if it's a loud transition. If, if those quantum rules aren't met, that's a much lower probability. There's another way that it can go down, which is it can be collisionally de-excited. So the energy that needs to go away can be, can be given off to another part of collision. Now on Earth, stuff's always bagging into each other, so there are plenty of opportunities for collisions. So those low probability things <coughs> never happen. It takes too long. They bounce into something first and they drop to a lower state. So we never see those transitions. But in space, sometimes we have very low densities and particles can go a long time without colliding into anything. And then they're actually around long enough for that transition to take so this is, an, this is a really sort of key thing that allows us to come up with our model of quasars, is that there's certain lines, certain transitions, we can only see when material is very sparse. And there, there are other transitions, we see a different set of transitions, a fuller set when things are, well not a fuller set, a, a subset of those we can see when we condense the material. So there were actually two sorts of two sets of rules, quantum rules, and you can break one or the other. And uh, if we break them, that transition is, is marked with a bracket. We break one rule, it's called a semi-forbidden line. It has one bracket. We break both rules, it's called a forbidden line, and it has two brackets. So these things are forbidden, they're not allowed to happen, but they do anyway. In fact, we see them in every object we look at, so it's not that right. So they're forbidden on Earth, is basically. They're forbidden on Earth. Now, things can work both ways. So we have those atomic transitions where things go from high energy levels to low energy levels. A reverse process can happen. A photon can be absorbed, sending something uh, to from, from a lower energy level to a higher energy level. So this picture shows you some of the things you can have, some of the things that will produce different sorts of spectrum based on what we've learned so far. So we have a hot object, and we spread out its light in different colors. We take the spectrum, and we get a continuous spectrum. That's the black body we reach. If we <coughs> look at some gas, and now it's just cooler, but it's actually relatively hot gas. It's cooler than this, but the hot gas, um, we'll see this emission line spectrum. Now, if we, ha if we have this hot central object and we're looking through the gas, which is now cooler than the hot stuff, light will be absorbed at certain wavelengths. So we'll see a continuous spectrum with absorption lines, places where specific frequencies are missing. This top scenario is generally what we see in stars. We have a hot center on the outside part, and if it's at 3,000, 5,000 degrees, it's relatively cool compared to what's inside, and, and these specific frequencies of light are absorbed. Okay, so I'm throwing a lot of physics at you. And we're just going to go through all these processes, and then we're going to apply them to things that we see. 
There's some more exotic things that can emit light as well. Um, light emitted when charged particles are accelerated. And there are a couple of ways that things can be accelerated. Um, you know, one is one is the sort of normal thing going faster scale, right? it's changing your speed. Another sort of acceleration is the acceleration due to rotation, right? That's an acceleration too. And so when particles go around and around in circles, they give off light. It's called synchrotron radiation. Because we, we found about it when we made particle accelerators, where we're making charged particles go around and around uh, in circles. And this is actually an important component to quasars, uh, because uh, particles actually like to go around in circles, because when there's a charged particle in a magnetic field, the charged particles spiral around the helix around that magnetic field. And they give us a synchrotron radiation. So for certain types of quasars, especially when we're looking down the beam or the jet of the quasar, this is an important component. Another way you can accelerate a particle is by slowing it down. So it's deceleration. It's giving off. It's, it's losing energy. If you want things to lose energy, so they'll have to give off light. So if a particle smashes into another particle and it's going fast and has to slow down slowly, it gives off what's called Bremsdorf breaking radiation. It's radiation slowing down. Sometimes when we have a hot, thin gas, a cluster of galaxies, we see this kind of radiation in X-rays. It's because of particles smashing into each other. An electron runs into a proton and slow down. And uh, there's this is not actually not the production so much of light, but it, it boosts light. One thing that can happen if you have low energy photons sitting around, and we actually do, we have, we have a sea of photons. Right now, there's this low energy photons from the Big Bang coming through us all the time. Those photons can be boosted up. They can be made more energetic by particles smashing into it. And that's what's called inverse Compton. So these are exotic things don't need to worry about as much, but I just wanted to make you aware of some of the range of things, the range of physical processes that are producing light. Okay. So we have a set of ways that uh, light can be made. Now there's also a set of things that happens to light. And, 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 and understanding those is important as well, because these are all things, part of the mystery we're going to try to unravel with the spectrum. We can learn so many things, and, and, and the reason why is that the imprints of many processes are in this spectrum. So, the first major thing when you're looking at objects in the distant universe, things like galaxies and quasars, is you see what's called a redshift. You see that all those atomic lines that we know are specific frequencies, but we don't see them where we see them on Earth. We see them all shifted to the red. And our understanding of that is that that happens because the universe is expanding. So typically, the, there are a few ways to think of this. And typically, the explanation you hear is that the universe is expanding, so all the galaxies are moving away from us, and we see this sort of Doppler shift. We're shifting to that. I don't like to think of it that way. Let's instead think of light as a wave, right? As a certain wavelength. What's happening in the expansion of the universe is that space is expanding. So as space expands, that wavelength expands along with space. So what we're really measuring when we measure a certain redshift is we're measuring how much the universe has expanded from the time that light left the, the time the light left the object till the time the light got here. So this that's what this uh, this cartoon shows. It shows <coughs> this bell shape is is sort of a picture of the universe where in this dimension we're seeing the size of the universe, and in this dimension we're looking at time. And what we've built up, the picture we built up through you know modern astrophysics is that the universe started at a single point. It expanded in the Big Bang. That that expansion started to slow down because gravity was pulling everything together, so it starts to stay down. 
and then relatively recently, it, it stopped slowing down and actually started expanding faster. This is a great mystery of modern physics. We don't know why that is. We just measured it. Nevertheless, if we have a model of this expansion <coughs> history of the universe, what we can do is when we've measured a certain redshift, we know how much the universe has expanded between the, then and now. You can see that that object has undergone this much expansion. And we can put that on a place on this. <coughs> we can figure out a time that that light was moving. And that time also gives us a distance that that object is away from us now. So this is really the trick we use to map. And that's why this little survey is taking spectra of all this object. It's really to get distances from objects. This is pretty cool. So you can actually figure out the expansion history of the universe just by looking at an ensemble of different spectra. Now, there's that other effect, though. So we'll separate this out. We'll separate out the expansion, the stretching of the wavelength. But there is also a Doppler effect. So if you look up at the, the picture on the upper right, if we're giving out waves, and these waves are coming out, and we're moving in a certain direction, in the direction we're moving, those waves bunch up. The frequency or the wavelength gets shorter. In the direction away from the motion, the reverse happens the wavelengths get longer. So if something's moving away from us, we expect its wavelength to get longer. So this is the, the Doppler effect. And we see that as well, because things, even though the universe is expanding, things are, and while the universe is expanding, if we take out that expansion, stuff's still moving around. Let me play this again. This is a simulation of the formation of uh, a cluster of galaxies. You see lots of galaxies form, and you see those galaxies moving around each other. So on top of this expansion of the universe and this trick that lets us get redshift, lets us turn redshift into distance, there's this extra motion. There's a certain component along the line of sight due to stuff moving around. And in dense clusters of galaxies, things are moving very fast. These galaxies might be moving around at something like hundreds of kilometers per second. It's pretty fast. So this creates errors. If we try to use redshift to get distance, well, things will get stretched out because stuff's moving around. So I'm going to show you uh, sort of this technique, redshift, allows us to map the universe. I'll show you what that map looks like. So this is the map from the zone survey. Second. Well, that was in your question. We had 76,000 phases in the data score. So we're probably close to 100 now. And data release 6, it's supposed to be today. Looks like it'll be tomorrow. I just got an email. So these are all different galaxies. We're pulling away from our hard place. We can see all these galaxies. They're kind of blown up their size a little bit. But you start to see the structures that are mapped out. And the contrast isn't green. But on the right, you see some clusters of galaxies here and here, where they're actually stretched out in little lines. And those, those lines, they're stretched out the way because of the errors through that, this Doppler motion. We're, we're billions of light years away. As we get farther out, we'll start to see the quasars. I haven't made any quasars yet. But these quasars are so bright. Yeah, go ahead. Is this what they mean by the universe being flat? <laughs> Uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of flattened into a plane. Well, that's kind of perspective. Here you'll see. Oh. And you'll see there are gaps because we have, we're just only mapped out certain sort of sections. So these, these are sort of the way the survey is taken. It's flattened to the universe or something else. Yeah, the flatness is a spatial flat. So it means it's, it's really three dimensional, but it has to do with um, sort of Euclidean geometry versus like geometry of spheres. It would look flat if you were in four dimensions. Whatever that means, right? Yeah, whatever that means, exactly. <laughs> right. So if you're looking for flat, it's not flat in the way we the, think These, um, the, the cyan things in the center are your quasars. This is actually, as we look out farther, we're actually looking further back in time. 
So we fly down there, they light from the big back. We can actually, well. <laughs> Just because that's the way the data was taken? That's right. Okay. There's not actual structure. Yeah, the structures that we're looking for, the structures inside this building. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that can mess with light is gravity. Mm -hmm. So you can see that. Uh, here's a, a great uh, Hubble image of a cluster of galaxies. And you can see that it's stretching out. So a cluster of galaxies has tremendous amounts of mass. You see these little arcs of, of um, those are distant galaxies behind the cluster whose light has been stretched out and bent into these shapes. Um, but it not only distorts the images, but it can actually change the way of light. Um, if we have um, an object with very strong surface gravity, a neutron star or a white dwarf, um, when light leaves its surface, <coughs> It's actually being pulled upon by gravity. Gravity acts upon light, and it will change the wavelength of light. It's called gravitational redshift. It will actually make that light redder than it was when it first left. It's because it's giving up energy to get out of that potential light. I'll show you an example of that in the sun spectrum. Uh, too. And then there's other stuff that happens to the light as well. So it has to come through our galaxy. Our galaxy has lots of dust. Dust preferentially scatters blue light over red light. So if it goes to a part of the galaxy that has more dust, the spectrum will be redder than it will be otherwise. We try to correct for this. A lot of stuff happens in our atmosphere. The upper part of our atmosphere has very hot gas that emits light radiation. A whole mess of it, especially when we're looking at the spectrum at the red end of the spectrum. These all have to be subtracted out. It's actually really hard. That's why you see there's a lot of noise and air at the red end of our spectrum. It's because we haven't properly directed for the sky emission. There's also sky absorption, which is called telluric absorption. We also we try to correct for that in the spectrum as well. These are all things that are happening that we're taking out of the things you're looking at, but it leads to errors. Okay. So let's talk about stars. We can organize stars from hot stars to cool stars. And that's, <coughs> there's this uh, spectral sequence, and it has a bunch of letters. O, B, A, F, K, G, O, B, A, F, G, K, M, O, B, a fine girl, kiss me. And then there's a T, an L, and a T after that. Um, you look at these, those stars are hot stars. In the blue light, um, the, the red stars are cool stars. They have more red light. As we change temperature, we start to see different species of absorption lines. So hydrogen and helium lines here. As we get to bright cool stars, they're cool enough that their atmospheres can support molecules as well. So we see molecular absorption, things like titanium oxide. And there actually are tons of molecular lines. So these actually all sort of blend together and form bands that kind of block out big regions. So there are all these different kinds of stars. Um, another way we can look at stars, well here, um, is, is something called an HR diagram. And that's just a plot, a 2D plot of this spectral type, the O, B, A, F, G, K, M, versus how bright the star is, its luminosity. And if you do that, what you find is most of the stars are along this line. And that's something we call a main sequence of light. Uh, main sequence. It's normal stars. It's what happens when the regular stars form, it's burning, it's fusing hydrogen at its center. Now, eventually that stops, it runs out of hydrogen, and the star evolves. It will come up here, it will, it will expand, it will become what's called a giant star. Now, as far as the Sloan spectra are concerned, we can't really tell the difference between a giant star, which is much brighter, and, 
and, and what a regular star. Regular stars are called dwarf stars. Our star is a dwarf star. Um, it, it's just light details about the, the widths of lines. It's actually kind of sophisticated. But they look pretty much the same. Even though what's happening in the center is very different. These stars are very helium. Uh, these stars down here are very hard. Eventually, like I said, our star will be somewhere around here. We'll evolve up here. Um, eventually, we'll blow off our outer layers, make a beautiful planetary nebula. Our star will collapse into something called a white dwarf, where it's not no longer regular matter, but all the matter of the sun has been compressed into something the size of the Earth. We take a cubic meter, it's called electron degenerate matter. If we, if we took a uh, cubic meter of it, it would weigh something like a billion kilograms. Very dense, and then we evolved down here to something called white dwarfs. These are very small things. I should show you this because I'm going to show you a white dwarf spectrum. This is the main sequence of stars. Again, to give you some idea of the relative size and colors of these stars. We have very, very few O stars. And, you know, we have a million spectra in Sloan. We probably have five or ten O stars in the whole circle. So now we'll start to look at uh, the spectral plots from SDSS for the first time. And so before we show you a sort of color band representation, but the, the more typical way we look at things is in this 2D line plot, we plot a wavelength. And the wavelength of the SDSS uh, uh, spectral gas goes from a little less than 4,000 angstroms, and angstroms a tenth of a nanometer, <coughs> to a little bit more than 9,000 angstroms. So it's slightly into the ultraviolet, but we come pretty much at the end of our blue spectrum slightly into the And in this axis we plot flux. It's the amount of energy we're getting per unit time per square centimeter of our detector um, per angstrom, per wavelength. So if we look at hot stars, like this guy, we see a very blue spectrum. We have more blue light, blue is over here, less red light, and we see some absorption lines. So all these absorption lines due to hydrogen. Um, when we have a cool star, this is uh, probably a K star, I think. We see more red light, less blue light. So it's a cooler star. We see different absorption features. We see these big blocks. These are, again, molecular absorption features. So we know it must be cooler. It has molecules. The molecules are Those are some sort of regular stars. Here's a, a white dwarf that I talked about. And here you see it looks very much like that, that first star, the hot star, up at the top. But the difference is, is that these lines are much broader. And that broadening is due to the gravitational redshift. It's due to, it's due to the photons having to pull themselves out, off the potential field of the white dwarf. Because the white dwarf is so dense and so tiny its surface gravity is very hot. And so light in little different places has to pull out of a different potential level and it broadens the light. So those are stars. We're going to sort of go through the universe. Basically in the universe we have stars, we have galaxies, we have quasars, and other stuff. The world is worried about these things. Stars, galaxies, and quasars. In galaxies, galaxies are a big mess of stars, hundreds of billions of stars, and some other stuff. So when we look at the galaxy spectrum, we're looking at the spectrum of hundreds of billions of stars, all added together. And we're also looking at dust, which radiates things, and gas. And remember what gas did? Hot gas lets out this line emission, right? We didn't see that in stars, the, the line emission. Look, this is uh, the Whirlpool Galaxy. You can see this beautiful spiral galaxy. You can see the dots, but some black areas we can't see through. You see this, this red area, and if I blew this up, you come down to the other attitude. But um, this is hot gas. It's been blown away from the stars. That hot gas is giving out lines of radiation. So let's look at some 
slow galaxy, uh, galaxy spectra. Um, there are basically two types of galaxies, pretty much. Elliptical galaxies, sort of balls of stars, and the stars are all moving around chaotically. They don't have very much dust and gas, they're mostly just stars, and the stars are red. The spectra look like this, so very much like that cooler star we saw. If you look in detail, you see these lines are a little bit broader because all the stars are moving around at different speeds. And you see certain elements. Typically, you know, this is calcium, there's magnesium, there's sodium. Kind of the stuff we're made of. Think of if you look at parts, the, the elliptical galaxies are also called early type galaxies. Spiral, there are also spiral galaxies are also called wave type galaxies. Um, and so this is a typical sort of spiral spectrum where we see it looks very much like the spectrum of a hotter star. Maybe not quite, this looks a little bit different because it's, it's, it's different kinds of stars being added together. But we, on top of that, we see this line emission. We see stuff like hydrogen, some nitrogen, sulfur, oxygen. That line emission is coming from this hot gas. Right, so we're seeing the hot gas component and we're seeing the stars. And the other type of galaxy we're really just seeing stars. So what can we learn by looking at that spectrum? Well, one of the things we can learn is we can learn how massive the galaxy is. So I said this looks like that, that cooler star. But really, it, it looks like it's a whole mess of cooler stars. It's billions of these. And each one of these is moving around. Each one's Doppler shifted by how much it's moving around. So if we look in detail at these lines and these lines, we'll see they're broader than they are in single stars. And we, if we measure in detail how much broader they are, we, we get an idea for how fast stars are on average moving around. So we do that. That's called the velocity dispersion. It's one of the things that's in the Sloan database. That velocity dispersion gives you the mass of the galaxy. You know how fast things are moving around, you have an idea of how massive the galaxy is. So by just in detail looking at this profile of these lines, <coughs> you how massive the galaxy is. I got a couple questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, how come these are dips and not spikes? Because I the late type galaxies there were spikes. Right. So this is yes. Because the early type galaxies, the spikes are coming from hot gas. The stars don't really have emission lines. Because they're mostly this they're basically if we had that model before, they're a hot thing surrounded by a cooler thing. The outer parts of the star are cooler than the center. So what's happening is that hot thing at the center is producing this continuous light. Cooler stuff on the edge is absorbing that light at specific frequencies. So these are absorptions. These are the absorption lines. And these early type galaxies don't have, don't seem to have any gas. We don't see any emission lines. So as opposed to the late type, they emit. Right. A late type, we, we, we see absorption there as well, but that's dominated by this emission. Yeah. And this emission is not coming from the stars. <coughs> it's coming from hot gas. It's coming from things like these red. Regions. If I were to blow this up, and this, this is a relatively nearby galaxy, if you really look at it, you can see at the center there's some blue stars that are really hot, and we'll see there's a bubble of red gas around them that's blown out of them. And that red gas is producing those specks. If you go back to the spectral um, graph you have for the late type galaxies, sure. um, is that noise in the background? You can see that thing that's sloping down, is that just noise? Well, I mean, this level is, yeah. is, is, is the flux of the galaxy. So okay. this, is, this is all you're seeing. You've seen some little variations that are probably the continuum? Is he asking about the continuum? I'm, I'm asking, asking about that. asking about what that line right. is. Right. Yeah. yeah, so that's basically, you know, we went back to the stars. It's basically adding together that continuum radiation from the stars. It's, it's all these different black body curves sort of added together from stars of different um, temperatures. Yeah. Spectral lines usually have a spectral element. There's 
for what? I'm going to come on those two have a picture because you see this pipe is identified as 10 pounds. 12 well, bullets well, in the transitions that are more likely to happen. Um, so for each, for, each, for each line, though, we can associate each particular frequency with a particular transition of a particular line. Okay, so this is, this is one particular transition, the, the, common, the most common transition that occurs in that line. Those are the ones we see. Right? So I mean, in this case, you know, there are some sets of things that are related to that. We see that that's actually a double that's two lines. This is two different lines. This is oxygen between these two lines. It turns out that this line is always three times as high as that. Just because of the rules. Transition here. This is another really cool thing we can learn. We can actually learn how many stars are forming in the galaxy right now. So uh, the way that works is that it's by looking at these uh, emission lines. So how much emission line we're, we're getting really tells us how many stars are forming. Because these lines are produced by excited gas that's de-exciting and letting out its light. Now for that, those electrons and that gas to be excited, we need a source, we need something that's exciting, something that's uh, exciting and that's ultraviolet radiation from stars, that's hot stars that are, that are uh, exciting the gas, and then the gas cools down by letting out light in these lines. Now it turns out that ultraviolet light is really produced only by very massive stars. These massive stars don't live very long. Millions of years, almost nothing, compared to the light from the galaxy. So if we're making more ultraviolet light now, we see more of this radiation. And what that means is, since those stars don't live very long, they must be forming right now. So when we see a lot of wide emission, that means that the stars, that galaxy is forming a lot of stars now. So what that means is late type galaxies are forming <coughs> stars, early type galaxies have stopped forming stars. So this is just kind of an extra slide just to kind of show you the sort of details we can pull out of spectrum and sort of how fascinating these things are. So I, I want to give you guys an idea of the processes and procedures. So when you come to like a new spectrum you haven't seen before, some of these things look like a lot of other spectra. You know, you just put them in a box and they're easy to classify. There are things, there are things in our survey that people don't understand, right? There's stuff you'll see that's a complete mystery to everyone in the collaboration. And so these are the tools we have to pull together to try to understand what's going on. This first spectrum is a bit weird. It kind of it shows absorption, um, this sort of wide absorption at the location of uh, hydrogen lines for something at redshift zero, so it's like a star. But it also shows double peaked emission at each of those uh, positions. So the, the broad absorption kind of looks like this. It looks like a white dwarf. But in the middle of each of these in the middle of each of those broad absorption is this double peak emission. Any idea what that might be? And that's kind of strange. So this is one of the more unusual spectra we'll see. And our interpretation of this is that we're looking at a binary star system. We're looking at a white dwarf and another star. And we can't really see the other star spectra too well, but we know it's there because that when we fix happenings, that other star is feeding the white dwarf with material. That material is spiraling, spiraling around the white dwarf, forming a disk, something called a decretion disk. That disk is spinning very fast. Half of it's spinning towards us, so it's blue shifting. Half spinning away from us, it's red shifting. That makes a double peaked emission. So I mean, that's kind of a crazy model, a very elaborate system, but we get just from reading off this spectrum. Again, you know, that's, that these are our only information we get that. Why is it double peak just because it's, it's close enough to it? Because the quasars are all, they're broad, but they're only a single peak. Is that just a factor of distance? It ends up to be double peak because you've got a star that's in our galaxy versus looking at. Yeah, not all of these things are double peaked, but 
you have stuff spiraling on, um, it could be a number of things that make it double peaked. I mean, for one thing, we're looking at a small disk relatively nearby, right, and we're looking at edge on, mm -hmm. which we have to be looking at edge on for us to work. Okay. Something we can never observe in a quasar is the edge on accretion. Oh, okay. um, and if you imagine there's more stuff sort of on the edge that's coming forward and less stuff right. sort of in the middle. I think that's the interpretation. So we think that's what's happening. This is a binary system. So matter is falling onto a white dwarf. Ten minutes? Good, that's all I need. Um, and what happens is white dwarfs actually can only be so massive. They're, they're this strange kind of matter that can only support so much mass. So they get heavier than, there's something called the Chandrasekhar limit. They get heavier than 1.4 solar masses, they collapse. And when they collapse to almost nothing, the whole material will bounce back and form a supernova. So this is a, a special kind of supernova. Now, if we look at the one on the bottom, we see a really strange spectrum. We see broad lines, and we see what looks like a galaxy. These are late type galaxy emission lines. And the interpretation of this is that you know, this might very well be the future of this kind of system in another galaxy. What we're seeing is another galaxy where one of these guys has given enough mass that it's formed a supernova. We're seeing a supernova on top of the galaxy. So these are the kinds of stories we're able to, to uh, piece together just by reading spectra. So finally, we'll talk about AGNs and spectra. And, and this is where you'll try to put together your story. So in 200 galaxies, you see some here. They're kind of distant. They look fuzzy. But they have this bright center. The galaxies with something different going on. They don't look like they type galaxy spectra. And the difference is meaning that these lines are not narrow anymore. They're quite long, right? Some of the lines are broad. These are forbidden transitions. The forbidden transitions stay narrow. But the other transitions are broader. And if you look in detail, some are broader than others. This is a redshift of one. If you go on farther, Look at a, at a different redshift, see if it's been shifted over the red. There's another type of object called a quasar. And really, there's not much difference between a galaxy and a quasar. A quasar is really something historically, quasar means quasi stellar radio source. So they were detected in the radio, we looked at them, and we saw a point source. Now we started to find things, lots of things like it, not all of which have radio, but we still call them quasars. We probably should call them QSOs, which is this quasi quasi-stellar object. But people we tend to be sloppy and still call them quasars, even when there's no radio. But to be quasi-stellar means we can't see the galaxy. And that's a function of really how good is our telescope. You know, with different telescopes we can see fuzz around them and sometimes we can't. So it's kind of a bad definition, um, the historical definition. Now we try to divide things even between the AGN and quasar historically had a lot to do with what we could see. But now I think we more likely, we prefer to do it based on how powerful is all this broad line stuff versus how powerful is the galaxy. So we look at different redshifts. As we go to different redshifts, we see different lines. There's a redshift of one, two, three, four. Something very special happens uh, around the redshift of three is that this line shows up. It's lime and alpha. It's the most basic transition in the universe. It's from first excited state of hydrogen, most of the universe is made of hydrogen, to the ground state of hydrogen. And we see some interesting stuff. When we start to look bluer of, of um, lime and alpha, we start to see lots of absorption. And that absorption is due to the fact that there's lots of hydrogen in the universe. And we're seeing absorption of this line from stuff in between us and them. So if you're not at this redshift, but at a lower redshift, you're, you'll be, you'll see, you're, you're, you'll absorb stuff <coughs> somewhere along here. And by seeing where that stuff's absorbed, you actually get a picture from every quasar of all the hydrogen between us and them, at least over a certain range of energy. You can see the quasar gets redder. Blue here, greenish there, and blue really there. This object at the end is a redshift of five. It's probably one of the 10, 20 
most disinnocuous thing that we detected. 